So, this week, we've been building up all the tools necessary to sketch uh, complicated curves. And today we're going to continue on uh, hitting the first derivative test, which I write F prime test, but usually said first derivative test. Uh, and before we do that, we'll actually prove the ID test, which we, we, uh, we talked about yesterday. Uh, we'll then go on to the concavity test and time permitting the second derivative test. So let's begin by recalling our mnemonic for how we're going to sketch curves. So Dai said, first the critical test. Then a cavity. And then a second test. Okay, and at the end of the day, I'll add one more sentence to this. Okay, so let's just quickly go over, right? What does the D stand for? Domain, right? We're going to find domain first. Then comes. The intercepts, x and y intercepts. S? Symmetries. What kind of symmetries? Odd or even function, right? Or no, could be neither. Okay, this is good. No symmetry. Right? And what about uh, oh, we have these really nice functions? Ah, like periods, right? Sine, cosine, and so forth, right? You period this. Okay, then this A we talked about yesterday. Those are the asymptotes, right? We had, there were two kinds, right? Horizontal. And vertical. Very good. Okay, good. So we have our two kinds of asymptotes we get. And remember the way we found those asymptotes. For horizontal, you look as x goes to infinity or minus infinity and see if it gets to a number. And for vertical, you take the limit as x goes to a number and look whether it goes to plus or minus infinity. Okay. So at the end, we start talking about ID. And what was ID? Increasing, decreasing. Good. Okay. So the question was, well, when does the graph increase? And we actually wrote down definitions for it, right? Now let's recall. I'll just, I'll just write one of them down. Remember the other one was the same, but backwards. So F is increasing on an interval I. And remember, didn't worry about open interval, closed interval, just so on an interval. If for all, well, if you take any two points in the interval, well, one of them will be bigger than the other. So if for all x1 less than x2 and i, f of x1 less than f of x2. Okay? Or as you guys put it, as the x's got bigger, the y's got bigger. Okay? That's what it meant for f to be increasing. Okay? And decreasing was the same, except you took this and reversed it. As the x's got bigger, the y's get smaller. Okay. So, right, we then wrote down the ID test. Okay, and what did the ID test say? Well, if the derivative of the function was positive for all x in some interval, then what could I say about the function? So if the derivative is positive. It's increasing. It's increasing, right? It means all the tangent lines are positive slope, right? Then we're saying, ah, then the graph must be going up. And f is increasing. Okay. And the same thing is going to work the other way. If the derivative is negative, for all x in the interval, then f, I should say f is increasing right on the interval i. So f is increasing on i. And then f is decreasing on i. Right? So if the derivative is negative, the tangent lines are all negative, the graph must be going down. Okay? So we want to prove this. Right? We didn't prove that, we just stated it. Now you remember what theorem I said we were going to use to prove it. The mean value theorem. Right? Very good. Okay. 
And so let's just recall what that says. Okay, so again, we didn't prove this, right? But we just try to get a good intuitive feel for it. We're going to talk more about it next term. We have some function, right? Natural graph. Okay, we pick a point on it. Maybe it's a, f of a, and then some other point over here, b, f of b. Okay, and so what this represented, perhaps, right? This might have been a uh, a graph showing the position of some particle over time, right? And so, if you want to know, for instance, the average velocity of your particle, right, how is that geometrically represented? Change in y over change in x, right? Which, but geometrically, what do I? I draw the what? Tangent line. Tan, now the tangent line. What will that give me? That's the instantaneous velocity. I want the secant line exactly, right? Secant will give me the average velocity. Okay. And so, between these two points. I draw the secant line, and that will tell me, the slope of the secant line will tell me the average velocity between the points A and B. Okay. And Tong said, okay, this is the, the change in y's over the change in x's, right? Well, the change in y's is f of B minus f of A, and the change in x's is B minus A. Okay, so what did the mean value theorem say? Well, see, what was our example? We said, okay, you're driving and you go on a trip uh, and you average 45 miles an hour for the trip. And so what can we conclude? At some point, you must have been going 45, been going 45 miles an hour. Right? Because either you went 45 exactly the whole time, which is unlikely, or right, you either you went a bit above it, you went a bit below it. Okay? But at some point, you actually had to hit it by the intermediate value theorem. Right? Incidentally, uh, I think this is how the cops can get you driving around here. All right? Maybe you go into a tunnel and, well, I'll just make up some numbers. Let's say, uh, well, let's, let's throw, I don't know, maybe there's no tunnel that's this long. Let's just make the numbers easy. Let's say you go into, uh, you go on a road and the road is 50 miles long and it takes you an hour to drive it. It took me an hour to drive 50 miles. How fast am I driving? 50 miles an hour, right? That's, that, at least that's my average velocity. Yeah? Now, let's say a cop is following me the whole way. Okay, he's following me. But he has no radar gun, and his speedometer is broken. Right? Can he tell how fast I'm going? At any given point, can he tell me how fast I'm going? He has no radar gun. He has no speedometer. No, right? Maybe he has a watch, okay? That's about it. Okay, and maybe he knows the length of his road. But after an hour, right, if he, he looks down at his watch, okay, it's been an hour and we just drove 50 miles. Okay, he's driving 50 miles an hour on average. Let's say it's a 35 mile an hour zone. What can he conclude by the mean value theorem? I sped at some point. I sped at some point, right? If I average 50 miles an hour and the speed limit was 35, well, if I averaged 50, I must have been going 50 at some point, which means I went over the speed limit. So a cop can get you without even having his radar gun or a speedometer. So be careful. Right? You drive into that tunnel and you come out of the tunnel, you think, oh, he didn't see how fast I was going in the middle. <laughs> but he may know how long it took you, in which case he can tell that you were speeding. Okay. So geometrically, what does the mean value theorem say? Right? Well, it's going to say that at some point you must have been going this average velocity, which means at some point, the tangent line to the curve, somewhere between A and B, is going to have the same slope as the secant line. So let's see, where might that have been? Well, how about right about there? I think the tangent line there is going to have roughly the same slope. Okay, so that corresponds to a point C. Okay. Now you might think, well, did you get lucky that there was some point where you had the nice slope, right? And the mean value theorem says, no, you didn't get lucky. Right? 
there always has to be this point C in between A and B, such that the slope is the same. Okay. At least if we put some hypotheses on the function. Okay. And so algebraically, the way we write this is, well, the slope of the secant line is the slope of the tangent line at C, and the slope of a tangent line is the derivative at C. Okay. So that's what the mean value there is. Okay, and of course, what kind of hypotheses would we want on your function? Well, at some point, you're supposed to be taking derivatives. So you would expect the function, at least on the interval AB, is what? Differentiable. differentiable right? Okay. So you're going to need it to be differentiable. Okay. So if you write down the precise uh, hypotheses, which we will next term, uh, usually you write down that it needs to be differentiable on the closed interval AB and continuous on the open interval AB. Okay. These are technical things. And what we're doing. Okay, everything's going to work out just fine. You know, we don't have to worry about these right now. Okay, but later, this will be a bigger issue. Okay, so we'll have to worry about it. Okay, so let's use this to try to prove the increasing decreasing test or the ID test. Okay, at least we'll prove half of it. The other half is going to be identical. Okay, so to prove this, well, what do I need? I have a function, all right, and since the derivative is positive, say we'll, we'll prove the first half. Since the derivative is positive on some interval, then I know the function is differentiable on that interval. Right? Otherwise, it wasn't differentiable, it wouldn't have derivatives, right? They couldn't be positive. Okay, so I don't have to worry about the hypotheses of the mean value theorem here. Right? Everything's differentiable, we're golden. Okay, so I have some function which is differentiable and positive. Right? That, that, that is, the derivative is positive on this interval. And I want to show it's increasing, which means I need to show that for any pair of points x1 less than x2, that the y value is going. That f of x1 is less than f of x2. Okay, so let's do that. So let's let x1 less than x2 be in the interval. I need to say something about f of x1 and f of x2. Well, I do know the following. Let's look at this, this, this difference here, or this difference quotient. What does that look like? Yeah, it looks like something I just wrote. <laughs> this is good, right? We know we want to use the mean value theorem, and this looks awfully like that. Right? This is, what, and what did this correspond to? This was right, the slope of the secant line. Okay. So here, right, b was bigger than a here, x2 is bigger than x1. Okay. So everything's corresponding. Okay. And the mean value theorem says that there's some point in between x1 and x2, which is going to have, as the slope of its tangent line, exactly the slope of the secant line. So this is going to equal f prime of c for some x1 less than or equal to c less than or equal to s2, right? There's some c in between them. Okay, that's what the mean value theorem says. I can find some c in between such that the slope of that tangent line is the slope of the corresponding secant line. Okay, now, let's just get rid of this fraction. I'm going to take this x2 minus x1 and move it over. So f of x2 minus f of x1 equals f prime of c times x2 minus x1. Okay, what do I know about f prime of c? Hmm. What do I know about f prime of c? Okay, well, of course, I know it's the slope of this secant line. But there's a hypothesis. There's a hypothesis in my ID test that I haven't used yet. What's the hypothesis? It's differentiable, but I know more about the derivative than that. What do I know about the derivative, right? This is my hypothesis, right? If, what? It's greater, than it's greater than zero, okay? I know that my derivative is greater than zero. Okay. So this bit is greater than zero, right? That's positive. Okay. What do I know about x2 minus x1? Remember that x2 is bigger than x1. So what do I know about that difference? 
It's bigger than zero, exactly. Okay, so I take two numbers, they're both positive, I multiply them together. The answer is still positive. Okay, so f of x2 minus f of x1 is positive. Add f of x1 to both sides. And f of x2 is bigger than f of x1. Wait, what was I trying to prove? What was the goal? I wanted to show it was increasing, which meant that f of x2 is bigger than f of x1. Yeah. Okay, so we're done. And of course, to prove that when the derivative is negative, all right, that the function is decreasing is, is the same. Okay, you just have to turn these signs around, right? This would become a negative, right? This would still be positive, so this would be less than zero. You'd still add the f of x1 over, and then you'd have f of x2 is less than f of x1. Okay, so it's, it's pretty easy, right? So this mean value theorem makes, makes things very nice, right? The proof is very short. Okay. Let's, uh, let's do an example. How do we actually use this? Right, well, we did one yesterday at the end. Let's do another one. All right, let's look at x to the fourth minus 4x cubed. Right, we want to know where this function is increasing and where this function is decreasing. Okay, so what do we need to do? Well, the ID test says, what? What should I do? Take a derivative, Take a derivative right? Of course, in this class, what's the stock answer to any question? Take a derivative, <laughs> right? There's a very good chance of it being correct. Okay, derivative, x to the fourth. Fourth. Uh -huh. Minus 12x squared. So I want to know where this thing is positive, and I want to know where it's negative, right? Because where it's positive, my function's increasing. Where it's negative, my function is decreasing, okay? And remember what we said yesterday, kind of the standard practice for doing this is, well, figure out where it's zero, okay? And then draw what we call a sine graph. So set f prime of x equal to zero. Right? We're going to solve for x. So I have 4x cubed minus 12x squared equals 0. What should I do with this? Factor. What do I factor out? I have 4. What was it? And x squared. Excellent. Excellent. OK, and what am I left with? Let's see. x and 3. OK, so now it's really easy to see. What are where are my zeros going to be? Zeros and threes. Okay, right. X equals zero, x equals three. Okay, Stephanie, you look a little frustrated. No, You're no, happy? I just did it a different way. Oh, you did it a different way? Yeah, but mine is harder, so. Oh, okay. Well, we don't want to see harder methods. <laughs> okay, very good. Okay, so we have zero and three as, as our zeros. Okay, so here's what we do we draw a sine graph. And we add where the function is 0. And now, right, and this is, mind you, we're looking at the derivative, not the original function, right? We're looking at the derivative. Okay? We're going to plug in numbers in the intervals between right, 0 and 3, or before 0, or after 3. Okay? And see, what do we get? Do we get positive or negative? Okay, now, you can plug in any number you like. I find that it's easier to see what's going on if you choose extreme numbers. Right? So, okay, between 0 and 3, you don't have a lot of choices. Okay? But over here, you can make things right, as big in a negative way as you want. So I could throw in negative 100. Right? So that's usually then not going to have anything weird going on. So I throw in negative 100. What happens to it when I cube it? 
I get something really, really big, right? Negative 100 cubed, okay, times 4. Okay, and then I'm going to subtract, well, when I square negative 100, it'll be positive. Yeah? And then it'll be times 12, so I'm subtracting a big positive number. But what's growing faster here, the x cubed or the x squared? X cubed. X cubed, right? So if I make this even bigger, negative a billion cubed, it's going to be a heck of a lot bigger than this negative a billion squared. You know? So I know that the negative term is going to outweigh the positive term. Oh, good, right? I have a minus here, so it wouldn't even matter, right? If this is positive, I have negative minus positive. Okay, it's still negative. Okay, good, good, good. So it's negative. Excellent point. Okay, now I need to put in some number between 0 and 3. So when you have to go in between, just choose the easiest one you can think of. So what's the easiest number you can think to put in here that's between 0 and 3? 1. 1. Okay, good. What is it? Four minus twelve. We remember how to do that, don't we? It. <laughs> it doesn't even matter what it is, does it? We just care about the sign. Yeah. Four minus eight is going to be a negative number. Happens, and four minus twelve happens to be negative eight, which is fine. But it's negative. That's the important part. Okay. So it's still negative. And what about after three? Well, I throw in a really, really big number. Okay. Put in a, a billion in here. Okay, you're going to get a billion cubed times 4 minus a billion squared times 12. Okay? Positive minus positive. It could be negative, but right, that term really blows up faster than this term. Okay? So what do I get here? So I'm now able to conclude from this what? F of x is increasing on what interval? When is it increasing? 3 to infinity. Okay, I'm going to write 3 to infinity. And we know, of course, and we always have to put a curly bracket, a parenthesis right next to an infinity. What do I put next to the 3? Tongue says parenthesis. Anybody want to go for a bracket? I'm going to put a bracket. It's zero at three. So, but here's the question: Is it increasing? It's a good question, right? Does do you get to include the endpoint or not? Okay, it turns out you can you can do it either way. Okay, you can. Okay, that's not real notation. You never put both symbols. Either one is acceptable. Okay, it's it's perfectly fine. For any example? For any example. Yeah, yeah you, you get to choose whether you include the endpoint or not. All right? uh, it, it's, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of interesting asking, you know, is it increasing at a specific point right, where the derivative is zero? Okay? Uh, but remember what the ID test says. It says if the derivative is positive, then it's increasing on that interval. It doesn't say what happens when the derivative is zero, right? It says if it's decreasing, it's going down. If it's increased, if it's positive, it's going up, right? But what about zero? It doesn't, doesn't handle that case. You get to make your own convention on that one. OK. Uh, where is f of x decreasing? OK, so now here, here it gets interesting. So Ada says negative infinity to 3. But now, now it's not quite as clear that we want to say that it's really decreasing when the derivative is 0. It was one thing when it was on an endpoint. But now it's right smack dab, dab in the middle, right? It was going down, and then it plateaued. Or, well, What's the opposite? Valley? You plateau. Can you valley? I don't know. Okay. You get down to the bottom and it stops going down for a second. Okay? And then it starts decreasing again. That's right smack dab in the middle of the interval. All right? And everybody's shaking their head, which to me says you don't think that you should call that decreasing at that point anymore. Okay? So we break it up as two intervals. 
minus infinity to zero, union zero to three. And at these endpoints, you could actually use brackets if you wanted to. Okay, very nice. Any questions about this? This is not this is not so bad, right? At least at least when I make you do functions where the derivative is very easy and it's nice to factor. And, but of course we can make these arbitrarily difficult and I can make you cry. It's, don't cry late. It's okay. Okay. So we've now built up enough that we can talk about the first derivative test, right? What I call the F prime test. So to do that, right, the F prime test is going to tell me about local maximum and local minimum. So let's properly define those, at least in a hand wavy sort of way. So a function F has a local maximum. at x equals c if f of c is greater than f of x for all x in an interval around c. Okay, and here when I say interval, I really should say in an open interval. Say an open interval around C. Okay, but words sometimes are confusing. Let's draw a picture. Okay, we have this nice, perhaps it's a parabola. And I pick this point, which is higher than all the points around it. Maybe this graph went on and it goes up like that. Right. Off to infinity. This is certainly not the highest point on the graph. Yeah, because it goes up higher over here. But you put on your blinders, right? You just put a little interval around it and you look. Is it the highest just in that little interval? Okay, and if it is, it's a local maximum. Okay. What do you think we call this point? Local minimum. Local minimum. Why? Because if I just put on the blinders, it's the smallest point right, in that interval. Okay, so let's write that up. F as a local minimum at C if f of c is less than f of x for all x in some interval. And I should say some open interval. Around c. Why am I saying open interval? Right, normally I, I usually don't specify to say interval. But an interval could potentially include just the point c. That would be a closed interval, c to c. And I don't want to have just one point sitting in the middle of nowhere, right? Maybe with nothing else around it, and say, well, that's a local maximum or local minimum. Right? I really want it to be bigger than things around it. Okay. So we have local max and local min. And well, how are we going to find these things? They're, I mean, of course they're important. You know, you throw a ball up into the air, you want to know its highest point. You shoot the rocket up, you want to know where it's going to stop before it comes down. Where the uh, increasing and decreasing changes? Ah, where the increasing and decreasing changes, okay. So what happens when the increasing and decreasing changes? Flattens out. Right? Flattens out, right? Stephanie, what are you going to say? The derivative is zero. Yeah? Flattens out, the derivative is zero. Same thing down here at the minimum.
So this observation you guys just made is a very old observation. Fermat made it way back in the 1600s. Not Fermat, by the way. Fermat. He was French. He said if F has a local max or a local min at x equals c, and, and this and is key, okay, and we'll see in a second, and f prime of c exists, okay, so if the derivative of t exists, then the derivative of c will be 0. Okay, now why is it important that f prime of c exists? Well, what's, what's our, the example we always think of when we want to think of a function whose derivative doesn't exist somewhere? Absolute value, Absolute value right? At that's zero. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at that situation again. So, we have our absolute value of x. Derivatives exist everywhere except at zero, right? They're minus one over here, they're one over here. I just have that little problem at zero. Where's the local minimum? Does it have a local minimum? Stephanie shakes her head. Why not? Why does it have a local minimum? Because there's no point for f of zero. Oh, there's no point for f of zero. You're saying absolute value of zero doesn't exist? Is the absolute value of zero? Yeah, but I thought. It's not, right, it's not differentiable at zero. But the function does exist. In fact, it's a continuous function, isn't it? Right? What's the limit of this function as you go to zero from the left? Zero. zero. And what's the limit from the right? Zero. And what is the value at zero? Zero. zero. So it's continuous, right? Because the targets agree. Right? So you can actually try to nuke the weapons factory. Okay, then you hit the button, the missiles fly off, and it actually hits the target. Right? So it's continuous. Okay, so it's a continuous function, but it wasn't differentiable. Right, why? Because what are the limits of the slopes as you can approach zero from the left? Negative. Negative one, right? And from the right? Positive, oh, right? So the, the slopes, they don't agree. The limits don't agree. So it's not differentiable at zero. Okay, but it is continuous at zero. Okay, so, but, but none of that actually should matter. I mean, as long as it's defined, right, which it is, what, is, what do I need to be a local minimum? Right, what's the definition say? It just needs to be smaller than everything around it, right, in some interval. That's all it means. Okay, well, look around it. it clearly, this is the smallest point in a little neighborhood, right? You just go here to here, right? It's clearly the smallest. Okay, so this is definitely a local minimum. Let's say I read Fermat's statement without this and f prime of c exists. Then it would say if f has a local max or a local min, then f prime of c is zero. Okay, but what is f prime of zero? Does not exist, right? That's the whole point. It does not exist. Okay, so you can have local mins and local maxes even when the derivative is not zero. But it's going to happen when the derivative doesn't exist. Okay? If the derivative is 4, then you know you don't have a local max or a local min. Okay? Because if you did, right, then it would exist, and then the derivative is 0. It can't be 4. Okay? So this means that it's important, of course, to check where the derivative is 0 if you want to look for local max and local min. But it's also important to check where f prime of c does not exist, okay? but is still in the domain of the function. Okay? 
right? So zero is in the domain of the function, but f prime of zero doesn't exist. So it's a potential local max or local min. In this case, it actually is. Okay? Wouldn't, it doesn't always have to be, but in this case it is. So we're going to give a name to these special places where either the derivative is zero or the derivative doesn't exist. We're going to call those critical numbers, right? That's where this critical bit comes from. Okay, so we let C be some number in the domain of our function. C is a critical number. of s if one of two things holds. Right? Either f prime of c is zero, right? that's kind of a good case, or f prime of c does not exist. Okay, but remember that top condition. It should be in the domain to start. Right. So for instance, look at the square root of x as a function. Is minus 4 a critical number for the square root of x? Why not? It's not in the domain. Okay. So I, I can take the derivative of the square root of x and say, oh, look at that. Minus 4 is not, it, the derivative is not defined at minus 4. Right. But it wouldn't be a critical number because minus 4 wasn't even in the domain to start with. Okay, you're only looking at points which are in the domain of the function. Okay, so these are, these are critical numbers. And I'm going to use very non-standard terminology or notation here. Uh, the set of critical numbers of f will be denoted by crit. So this will just make it easier. I can just say find crit of f, right? Or you guys can write crit of f equals, and then put them down. Okay, but this is not a, a standard notation. Okay, let's see. Okay, so I think now we can write down precisely the first derivative. Okay, so all the first derivative test is saying is under certain circumstances, you have a local max or a local min. Okay? And it's actually not going to say anything that you didn't already figure out. Okay, just by the ID test and looking at pictures. Okay? The ID test tells me what? If the derivative is positive, then the function is increasing. Increasing. Okay, if the derivative is negative, the function is decreasing. Okay. Now if I have a local maximum, okay, what does the function look like? So I'm coming up over here, up to this local maximum. What's the function doing? It's increasing, increasing which means its derivative is, is what? Positive, right? So all going up, it's increasing. The ID test says, oh, okay, must be positive, right? And what about on the other side? It's decreasing. Yeah, it's decreasing, right? The derivatives are negative. That's what happens when you have a local maximum. It goes from positive derivatives to negative derivatives. Yeah. Note that even is true for the absolute value, right? Except in the reverse, right? Here we're talking about a minimum. So you have negative derivatives going to positive derivatives. Okay? On one side it was negative, on the other side it became positive. And the fact that it's not defined, or the derivative isn't defined, there, you still can get it to local minimum. So this is, this is kind of nice. Okay, so the first derivative test will say this. If f prime of x goes from positive to negative, okay, then you get a local what? Max, right? Positive to negative. OK? 
Okay, if you ever forget, you just draw it in, your, in the air, right? Positive to negative. Okay, so you get a local max. Okay, and if f prime of x goes from negative to positive, you get a local negative to positive. So it's a min. Okay, there's your first derivative test. Okay. So you actually you don't have to do anything new. Right? You just look at you do your ID test, draw your sign graph, you see where it's going up, see where it's going down, and then all the places where it switches signs from negative to positive or positive to negative, boom, you got it. Okay. What numbers should you be checking? The critical numbers. Okay. And when we did the ID test on this one example, I remember this x to the fourth minus 4x cubed, we had all these zeros, and that's where we checked the sign changes. Okay. And what were the critical numbers of that function? What's that? Zero and three. They were zero and three. And were there any other critical numbers? Could there be? Well, how do you get other critical numbers, right? They have to be either, well, where it's zero, we found those zero and three, or where the derivative didn't exist. But of course, our derivative was continuous with the whole the number line, right? No problem. Okay, we had no worries about things that which didn't exist. Okay? But in general, you have to write down both the zeros and the critical numbers on your line. Okay? And then you do your sign graph and put in all the sign changes. So let's, I don't want to erase that in. Let's do an example. I guess this is that. Now let's do one more complicated. Let's say, uh, are you guys want a challenge? Sure. Okay. Let's look at f of x equals x squared over x minus 2 times x minus 6. Okay. So this is certainly not trivial. Okay. So let's, let's try to figure out the local maxes and local mins of this thing. Okay. We'll use the ID test to do that. Okay. So we need to write down the derivative. Okay. What rule am I going to use? Quotient rule. Quotient rule. Excellent. Okay, so low D high, less high D low, E I E I O. Okay, so low D high, so the derivative of x squared, which is 2x, two two I'll put that in front, minus high D low. So, okay, I get x squared times, oh boy, okay, do the derivative of this thing. What's the derivative of the bottom? What do I have to use? Bottom rule. Okay, so I'm going to get. Yeah, I fix one of them, x minus 2, times the derivative of x minus 6. This is x minus 2. Just x minus 2, right? Because the derivative of x minus 6 is 1. So I get an x minus 2. Okay, plus, now I, I'll fix the x minus 6 and take the derivative of x minus 2. 1. 1, right? So I just get x minus 6. Okay, that's not so bad, right? Things will simplify a little bit in there. Right, you just get uh, what, 2x. Minus 8. Did I do that correctly? Yep. Yeah. Okay, and then, well, I can't just leave it like this. What do I have to do? Did I do the whole quotient rule? Oh, <laughs> right? It's a quotient rule. There better be a quotient in the end. What am I put on the bottom? Well, I have to square this thing, right? So I just square the terms individually. So, what should I do? Well, if I'm going to find critical numbers, I need to figure out where this thing is going to be zero and where it's going to be undefined. Now, let's do the easy one first. Where is this thing definitely not going to be defined? Two and six, right? And then half problem here. So, two and six are going to be critical numbers of x. Okay, for sure. Okay. 
They come from down here. Okay, now what about the top? Okay, what is the top going to give me? Well, remember, for doing critical numbers, you need to figure out where it doesn't exist and where it's zero. So, of course, a fraction is going to be zero when the numerator, numerator is zero. Okay, so I just need to figure out where the numerator is zero. Wait. Okay. Hey, well, we better get to work. All right, so let's see here. I can, I can completely forget about this denominator. Okay. I'm just going to simplify the top as much as I can. So right, eventually I want to try to cancel some terms out. Let's see here. That's going to make, let's see, uh, well, let's put the 2x in at the end. Right, so we'll copy it first and then see what we get. And then let's see, on the other side, we have x squared times 2x minus 8. And it's supposed to be equal to zero. So let's see. Uh, x squared times 2x is 2x cubed. And you have minus 6x minus 2x is minus 8x times 2x is minus 16x. Sorry, x uh, yeah, squared. And then plus 12 times 2x is plus 24x. Okay, so that's that first term. And what about this? Okay, this one's easier minus 2x cubed, and then plus 8x squared equals 0. Tell me if I make any arithmetic mistakes, please. OK, does anything nice happen? Ah, excellent. 2x cubed cancel. Good, 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 good. Those go away. Let's see, minus 16x squared plus 8x squared, so minus 8x squared, and then a, that takes care of those, and then a plus 24x equals 0. Oh, well this isn't so bad. What can I do with this? Factor! What do I factor? Negative, negative 8x. Yeah. I'll take a neg negative 8x, that sounds nice. Okay, I'm left with an x, minus 3. Okay, so, what do I get? Where are my zeros? Zero, three, zero. X equals zero and three. Huh, coincidence. That was the other. <laughs> That's what happened to the other one. Okay. So which means that zero and three are also critical numbers. Okay. Okay. So what is the set crit of f? What are all the critical numbers now? Zero, two, three, six. Okay, cool. We now know the critical numbers, which means we now can draw our sine graph and figure out everything. And I guess I didn't formally introduce this term. Uh, whenever you see me draw a real number line without putting a perpendicular real number line, and I start drawing a bunch of numbers on it and then putting signs above it, I call that a sign graph. Okay. Because it's a graph and I put signs on it. Okay. So what am I going to put on my sign graph? Oops, this is the sign graph of f prime. And it's not the sign graph of f. It's the sign graph of f prime. Okay, I put the critical numbers on this graph. I put 0, 2, 3, and 6. So these are all the places where either the derivative was 0 or did not exist, which means these are all the places where I could possibly have what? Local maximum. Okay. okay, so now I just need to put in the signs and then look for sign changes. Okay, so what's going to happen? Uh, let's see, where's my... So I wonder if I can write this down in a nice enough way. Let's, this is right what the top ended up being. So let's, just for fun, just for fun, let's rewrite our derivative. So I want to show you guys a little trick about how to do this faster. Okay. So the top, right, that's simplified down to negative 8x times x minus 3. Yeah? Oh, did you have a question? 
can't two and six not be max and min because they don't exist? Or they make the denominator zero? Well, this, okay, so, so this is a, there's two answers to your question, and that's a good question. All right. This is where the derivative doesn't exist, mm -hmm. right? And so if you for, didn't know what the function was, then the answer is yes, it, these could be local max and right? For instance, the absolute value function, say that was the derivative. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, or the derivative, I mean, the absolute value, the derivative at zero doesn't exist. Okay? But you still get a local minimum there. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, if you go back to the original function, you'll notice you can't stick two and six into these either. And so, of course, they can't actually be local max or mins for the original function. So that's true. That's absolutely right. Okay, but we do this a little bit naively at first. Okay. So, let's see, our derivative, we computed, had an x minus 2 squared on the bottom and an x minus 6 squared on the bottom. And on top, it was this nasty expression which simplified to minus 8x times x minus 3. Okay, now, if we put in something really, really, really small, okay, like minus a, a billion, okay, what happens to this first term? It becomes... Negative eight billion. Right, we'll see, that's a negative billion, but then there's a negative eight, right? So it becomes positive a billion, okay, times eight. Okay, and then, okay, negative a billion minus three, well, it just becomes still negative, right? So we'll positive, negative, and then on the bottom, well, look at this. I have squares everywhere. And squares are always going to be positive. Okay, so I have positive, negative, positive, positive. So negative over positive is going to be negative. negative. Excellent. Okay, now, here's the trick. Okay, in principle, you should now start plugging in values in between each of these intervals, right? Okay, but here's something cool. At least when you have nice rational functions. Look at where this comes from. Where did this zero come from? It came from that x, right? X is an odd function. And what happens when you have a uh, you switch from negative to positive in an odd function? Well, you put a negative into x, you get a negative number. You put a positive into x, you get a positive number. What about x cubed? Another odd function, right? You put a negative into x cubed, and you get what do you get? A negative. You put a positive into it, you get positive. So it always switches signs, right? With an even function, what happens? You put in a negative into an even function, you get positive. You put a, a positive into a positive function, positive. It doesn't switch signs. Okay? So that means everything else is going to stay the same, right? Except for this 1.0. Okay? So when you, you start putting in a positive number in for x, then this thing switches signs from negative to positive, and everything else stays the same. So you'd end up with negative, negative, positive, positive. So it would be positive over positive, which is positive. Okay. Another way to think about this is, you look at where this critical number comes from. If that's an odd function, you just switch the sign. If it's an even function, you keep the sign. So since zero came from an odd function, you switch. Where does two come from? Two comes from down here, which, what kind of function? Even, which means, what do I do to the sign? Keep it the same. So that's your positive. All right? The 3 came from x minus 3, so what do I do to the sign? Come on. What do I do to the sign? Who's saying? X, 3 comes from x minus 3. What kind of function is that? Odd or even? Um, Odd function. So what do I do to the sign? You switch it, right? So it was positive, it becomes negative. Okay? Then I go to the 6. 6 came from even. even. So what do I do to the sign? Even. I leave it. Okay. So this is really cool because you just have to check one of them. And then you can immediately write down the rest. Okay? Wait, so an even the sign doesn't change the odd does. Exactly, right? And if you always you just want to remember, right, what happens with x squared? x squared, it doesn't matter if you put in minus x or plus x. You get the same answer out. No. 
okay, this is great. Because now, now we can see what's going on. Okay, so I just realized we made a mistake. And it comes back to Chris's question, right? The exact thing that I warned us not to do, we did. What did I do that we did that we weren't supposed to do? We included points that weren't in the domain. Yeah, we included points that weren't in the domain. Okay? So that's where our naivety got us into trouble. Right? We said, right, two and six were critical numbers. Okay? And we said, oh yeah, but we're gonna, we're gonna be naive about it. Okay, and, and where did that get us into trouble? Well, the, the trouble is, right, critical numbers by definition, right, were things that were in the domain of the original function. Are two and six in the domain? No, you can't put two and six in, right? So this is wrong. Okay. I still think it's good to put them down. I still think it's good to put them in your sign graph. And the reason why is because what do you expect you, you might have at two and six? Right? Asymptotes, right? So this is useful. Because what happens with asymptotes, vertical asymptotes? Do they always go up the same way on both sides? No, right? 1 over x goes up on one side and down on the other side. Okay. So I think it's good to have them in your graphic. Okay, but well, what can we do as far as local max and local mins? Well, we just look for sign changes, right? Well, let's see. From at 0, it goes from negative to positive. Boom. You got a sign change, you got a local max. Or you got a local min? Min, right? Oh, okay, so it's going down, it's going up. So it's a local min. So what's the, the point, right? Well, 0 comma f of 0 is a local min. And what is f of 0? Zero, right? That one's pretty easy, right? You stick a zero on the top, you're done. <laughs> no problem, right? So this is equal to zero comma zero. So when we graph this out, we're going to have a point at the origin, and we're going to know that's a local minimum of the function. Okay. Do we get any other sign changes? At three. At three, right? It's another one of these critical numbers. Okay. It goes from positive to negative. So zero comma f of three is a local max. Okay. And what is f of three? Well, let's see here. 3 minus 2 is 1. 3 minus 6 is minus 3. So we get a minus 3 on the bottom, and we get uh, 9 on the top. So 9 over minus 3, which is minus 3. Oops. That should be 3, of course. 3 comma minus 3 is the local max. Okay, and there's no more sign changes, right? So we know there's no more local maxes or local mins. But we know more than just local maxes or local mins from this, right? We know where this function is going down and where it's going up. Right? And let's just for a moment assume that 2 and 6 are going to be points where we get vertical asymptotes. Just assume that for a moment. At 2, we now know what those asymptotes are going to be, right? We know that at 2, they're going to have to both go up, right? Because it's going possible here, right? These things are going up. You're not going to have one going up and one going down. And what about at six? What do the vertical asymptotes have to do? Yeah, are they going to positive or negative infinity? Negative infinity, right? Because the graph is going down. That's what the negative tells you. Okay. Yeah? If they're both going down, mm -hmm. then I mean that one of the slopes is Oh. So are we thinking about this all wrong? What do you guys think? Lace has an inspired comment. I'm sitting up here telling you, oh, they're both negative, so they're both going down, right? Is that, is that wrong? Did I, did, I, did I mess up? Thoughts? Let's draw a picture. Maybe that'll help us resolve this issue.
Okay, I have some graph and say I have a vertical asymptote at some point. Now let's say I know that on one side of the point it's, say, going down. Okay, that's what it tells us it's going down. So what, is it, what does the vertical asymptote have to be doing if it comes from the left? It has to go to negative infinity, right? Because the graph is going down. Okay. Okay, now I just said that if it's negative on the other side, then it has to be going down, right? So it has to go into minus infinity. Is, is there anything wrong with that argument? Right? If I draw this, okay, we're inclined to think, oh yeah, this curve is going this way, right? But the way we always read this is from this direction, right? Left to right. So what's the slope? Hmm? If I draw a tangent line, what's the slope of this tangent line? Derek, what do you think? What's the slope of this tangent line? Is it positive or negative? Positive. Positive. So that means the curve is going up, which means on the sine graph I should have a, a negative or a positive? Positive. Positive, right? If the graph is going up, what's the derivative? Positive. positive. If the graph is going down, what's the derivative? Negative. Negative. Okay? So what, what we're saying is that Leith caught it, right? Right? This is not going to accurately reflect this situation. Okay. What should it be? Well, if the graph is supposed to be going down, then my vertical asymptote actually on this side has to be going up to infinity, okay. which is a little counterintuitive, right? at least the language makes it so. Okay. But what's the slope of these tangent lines here? They're negative. Right? So that is what actually it should be doing. Okay. So you go from negative to negative, that's what it actually looks like. Very good, very good. Okay. And positive to positive, what is that going to look like? Well, if it's positive, then okay, on this side there's no problem, right? It means it's going up. What about on this side? What should it be doing? Going down, right? It's kind of counterintuitive. Okay, but here the slopes are now positive. Okay, the graph is going up as you go left to right. That's the key. Okay. So this is very nice because if these two and six turn out to be vertical asymptotes, then we now know exactly what the graph is going to look like around those. Okay, with positive positive, all right, it's going to have to look like this. And with negative, negative, it's going to have to look like this. Okay, so we're really building up a lot about this graph. Just using some well, rather simple tools. Take some derivatives, set them equal to zero. Right? You don't do a whole lot of hard stuff. Okay, so we're going to come back to this function. Okay, we're going to graph this function. But after we do the next uh, segment, which is going to be about concavity. You get all put together. So we've now done said first a critical test. Now we're going to do then a cavity. And the cavity comes from concavity. Dye's not having a very good day. But we are. But we are. Let's get some concavity out of the way. So let's draw this picture we drew a few weeks ago. You take your two points, right? Shortest distance between these two points is what? Uh, straight line. Straight line. Okay. Unless I'm driving, in which case I take a different route. Okay. But there's other ways, of course, of getting from point A to point B. Right. Remember, we had these these two ways that. Kind of typified all the other ways that we can get there. Great circle. The great circle. <laughs> ah, I like that answer. <laughs> I like that answer though. Okay. 
Now, of course, there's other things we can do where we kind of jag up and down, right? But if assuming we're always increasing or uh, yeah, always increasing up to our point, right? We never decrease, we never go backwards. Okay, these are somehow the three different ways you can get there. And let's say you take this root on top and you start drawing your tangent lines. Okay. What's the relative position of the curve to its tangent line? Does it lie below or above the tangent line? Well, let's see, the tangent line is up here and the curve is down here, so it lies below the tangent line. Okay. Let's Choose a different tangent line. Maybe I got lucky. Now let's pick one over here. Draw my tangent line. Okay, again, does it lie above or below? Below. Hmm, could be. Okay, let's draw one on this bottom one here. Draw my tangent line. Okay, that's a very bad tangent line. Okay, but what's the idea, right? Does it lie above or below it? Above it. Okay. Maybe that was. Maybe my graph is so bad that I got lucky. Let's try another one up here. Okay. Does it lie above or below it? Above it. Okay. So you have this curve, right, which is kind of facing down a little bit, and then there's one above it. And an equivalent way of saying that, well, it kind of bends down or it bends up, is saying it lies below. Or above its tan all the tangent lines. Okay. So we give a definition. Uh, F is, and of course, as usual in these situations, there are some missing hypotheses. Okay, which in the practice of our class doesn't come back to hurt us because we always get these hypotheses. Like, right? we're going to assume our function is differentiable on some interval. Okay. So we're going to say f is concave up on an interval i if the, if the graph of f is above the tangent line uh, to f at any point in i. Okay. So if at any point you take on the interval, you draw the tangent line, if the graph lies uh, above it, then we're going to call it concave up. And concave down is going to be the same, only I replace the word above with below. Okay. So I get graph is concave down if at any point in the interval you draw the tangent line and it lies above your curve. Okay. And the way I remember this, which one is which? Okay. Concave up is like a cup, concave down is like a frown. <laughs> Easy enough, yeah? Concave up like a cup, concave down like a frown. Okay, so the question is, right, one, why do we care? And two, assuming we answer that first question well, how do we actually figure out whether our graph is concave up? like a cup, or concave down like a frown. How do we do it? So the first right, answer is, well, there's a lot of ways that when you start trying to graph things, right, that you can get from point A to point B. Okay, we, here's three possible ways. Okay, and if you're trying to graph something, there's a big difference between a graph going up like this and a graph going up like this. For instance, okay, there's a big difference between, you might have some parabola which goes up, okay. or you might have some, maybe a square root function, which goes up. 
maybe that's x squared, and that's square root of x, and that's 1. Remember, square root of x goes like this, square root of x squared goes like that. And somehow when it's concave down, you know that it's growing a little slower somehow. Right? And if it's concave up, then somehow it's growing a little faster. At least that's what it appears. Although you can see it before one square root of x actually grows faster. It's kind of weird. Okay. So the reason why we care about these things is when we want to graph is well, it's going to be darn important to know what these things look like. Are they going up and around? Are they going down and around? Right? Are they concave up? Are they concave down? We make a little poem out of it. All right, so next time we're going to get back into this and we're going to answer the second question, which is how do you actually determine if it's concave or, or concave down? And the answer is going to be, well, what's the answer in this class? Take a derivative. Take a derivative, except this yeah. time again. you have to take the second derivative. You have to do it again, okay? So we took a derivative once right, to get our local max and min, right, to get our increasing, decreasing, to get concavity, we're going to take a derivative. Okay, so I'll see you guys tomorrow. Uh, on your way. Tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. What is tomorrow? Friday. And you know, you guys don't have. I have my other section on Friday. Okay. Very good. I won't see you guys. Have a nice weekend. Um, <laughs>